Lesson 2 A Moment of Destiny Sabbath Afternoon April 1 In all ages God has given human beings divine revelations that thus he may fulfill his purpose of unfolding gradually to the mind the doctrines of grace. His manner of imparting the truth is illustrated by the words, His going forth is prepared as the morning. He who places himself where God can enlighten him advances, as it were, from the partial obscurity of dawn to the full radiance of noonday. As the sun goes forth upon its errand of mercy and love, as the golden beams of the day flood the canopy of heaven and beautify forest and mountain, awakening the world by dispelling the darkness of night, so the followers of Christ should go forth upon their mission of love. Sons and Daughters of God, page 335. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. Men and women, enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaim the three messages in their order. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 387. God has called His Church in this day, as He called ancient Israel, to stand as a light in the earth. By the mighty cleaver of truth, the messages of the first, second, and third angels, he has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. He has made them the depositaries of his law and has committed to them the great truths of prophecy for this time. Like the holy oracles committed to ancient Israel, these are a sacred trust to be communicated to the world. The three angels of Revelation 14 represent the people who accept the light of God's messages and go forth as his agents to sound the warning throughout the length and breadth of the earth. Christ declares to his followers, Ye are the light of the world. To every soul that accepts Jesus, the cross of Calvary speaks, Behold the worth of the soul. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Nothing is to be permitted to hinder this work. It is the all-important work for time. It is to be far-reaching as eternity. The love that Jesus manifested for the souls of men in the sacrifice which he made for their redemption will actuate all his followers. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 455. Sunday April 2. Eternal Choices Before you are two ways, the broad road of self-indulgence and the narrow path of self-sacrifice. Into the broad road you can take selfishness, pride, love of the world. But those who walk in the narrow way must lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset. Which road have you chosen? The road which leads to everlasting death? or the road which leads to glory and immortality. There never was a more solemn time in the history of the world than the time in which we are now living. Our eternal interests are at stake, and we should arouse to the importance of making our calling and election sure. We dare not risk our eternal interests on mere probabilities. We must be in earnest. What we are, what we are doing, what is to be our course of action in the future, are all questions of untold moment, and we cannot afford to be listless, indifferent, unconcerned. Our High Calling, page 8 As Satan seeks to break down the barriers of the soul by tempting us to indulge in sin, we must by living faith retain our connection with God and have confidence in His strength to enable us to overcome every besetment. We are to flee from evil and seek righteousness, meekness, and holiness. It is time for every one of us to decide whose side we are on. The agencies of Satan will work with every mind that will allow itself to be worked by him. But there are also heavenly agencies waiting to communicate the bright rays of the glory of God to all who are willing to receive him. 
It is ours to choose whether we will be numbered with the servants of Christ or the servants of Satan. Every day we show by our conduct whose service we have chosen. Our High Calling, page 15. Such transformation of character as is seen in the life of John is ever the result of communion with Christ. There may be marked defects in the character of an individual, yet when he becomes a true disciple of Christ, the power of divine grace transforms and sanctifies him. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, he is changed from glory to glory until he is like him whom he adores. God can be honored by those who profess to believe in him only as they are conformed to his image and controlled by his spirit. Then, as witnesses for the Savior, they may make known what divine grace has done for them. True sanctification comes through the working out of the principle of love. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. The life of him in whose heart Christ abides will reveal practical godliness. The character will be purified, elevated, ennobled, and glorified. Pure doctrine will blend with works of righteousness. Heavenly precepts will mingle with holy practices. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 559 and 560. Monday, April 3. The Son of Man Returns. Not to any class is Christ's love restricted. He identifies himself with every child of humanity. That we might become members of the heavenly family, he became a member of the earthly family. He is the son of man, and thus a brother to every son and daughter of Adam. His followers are not to feel themselves detached from the perishing world around them. They are a part of the great web of humanity, and heaven looks upon them as brothers to sinners as well as to saints. The fallen, the erring, and the sinful Christ's love embraces, and every deed of kindness done to uplift a fallen soul, every act of mercy, is accepted as done to him. The Desire of Ages, page 638. Jesus is coming, but not as at his first advent, a babe in Bethlehem, not as he rode into Jerusalem when the disciples praised God with a loud voice and cried, Hosanna but in the glory of the Father and with all the retinue of holy angels to escort him on his way to earth. All heaven will be emptied of the angels while the waiting saints will be looking for him and gazing into heaven as were the men of Galilee when he ascended from the Mount of Olivet. Then only those who are holy, those who have followed fully the meek pattern, will with rapturous joy exclaim as they behold him, Lo! This is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. And they will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, that trump which wakes the sleeping saints and calls them forth from their dusty beds, clothed with glorious immortality and shouting, Victory! Victory over death and the grave! The changed saints are then caught up together with the angels to meet the Lord in the air, never more to be separated from the object of their love. Early Writings, page 110 God designed that the prince of sufferers in humanity should be judge of the whole world. He who came from the heavenly courts to save man from eternal death he who submitted to be arraigned before an earthly tribunal and who suffered the ignominious death of the cross, he alone is to pronounce the sentence of reward or of punishment. He who submitted to the suffering and humiliation of the cross here in the counsel of God is to have the fullest compensation and ascend the throne acknowledged by all the heavenly universe as the King of Saints. He has undertaken the work of salvation and shown before unfallen worlds and the heavenly family that the work he has begun he is able to complete. In that day of final punishment and reward, both saints and sinners will recognize in him who was crucified the judge of all living. In Heavenly Places, page 359. Tuesday, 
April 4 The Heavenly Judgment While the disciples were gazing upward to catch the last glimpse of their ascending Lord, He was received into the rejoicing ranks of heavenly angels. As these angels escorted Him to the courts above, they sang in triumph, Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord, to him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the heavens. Psalm 68, verses 32 to 34, margin. The disciples were still looking earnestly toward heaven when, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. The promise of Christ's second coming was ever to be kept fresh in the minds of his disciples. The same Jesus whom they had seen ascending into heaven would come again to take to himself those who here below give themselves to his service. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 32 and 33. Christ humbled himself to stand at the head of humanity to meet the temptations and endure the trials that humanity must meet and endure. He must know what humanity has to meet from the fallen foe that he might know how to succor those who are tempted. And Christ has been made our judge. The Father is not the judge. The angels are not. He who took humanity upon himself and in this world lived a perfect life is to judge us. He only can be our judge. Will you remember this, brethren? Will you remember it, ministers? Will you remember it, fathers and mothers? Christ took humanity that he might be our judge. No one of you has been appointed to be a judge of others. It is all that you can do to discipline yourselves. In the name of Christ, I entreat you to heed the injunction that he gives you never to place yourselves on the judgment seat. From day to day, this message has been sounded in my ears. Come down from the judgment seat. Come down in humility. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, pages 185 and 186. And God hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man, because he has tasted the very dregs of human affliction and temptation, and understands the frailties and sins of men, because in our behalf he has victoriously withstood the temptations of Satan, and will deal justly and tenderly with the souls that his own blood has been poured out to save. Because of this, the Son of Man is appointed to execute the judgment. But Christ's mission was not for judgment, but for salvation. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John chapter 3, verse 17. And before the Sanhedrin, Jesus declared, He that heareth my word, and believeth him that sent me, hath eternal life, and cometh not into judgment, but hath passed out of death into life. John chapter 5, verse 24, Revised Version The Desire of Ages, page 210 Wednesday, April 5 The Victor's Crown And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. The husbandman who putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come, can be no other than Christ. It is he who at the last great day will reap the harvest of the earth. But the sower of the seed represents those who labor in Christ's stead. The seed is said to spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. And this is not true of the Son of God. Christ does not sleep over his charge, but watches it day and night. He is not ignorant of how the seed grows. Christ's Object Lessons, page 62 
It is God who brings the bud to bloom and the flower to fruit. It is by His power that the seed develops. The plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. The child cannot by any anxiety or power of its own add to its stature. No more can you, by anxiety or effort of yourself, secure spiritual growth. The plant, the child, grows by receiving from its surroundings that which ministers to its life, air, sunshine, and food. What these gifts of nature are to animal and plant, such is Christ to those who trust in Him. He is their everlasting light, a sun and shield. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 19 and Psalm 84 verse 11. In the matchless gift of His Son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. As the flower turns to the sun, that the bright beams may aid in perfecting its beauty and symmetry, so should we turn to the sun of righteousness, that heaven's light may shine upon us, that our character may be developed into the likeness of Christ. Steps to Christ, pages 67 and 68. We need now minds that can understand the simplicity of godliness. More than we desire anything else, we should desire to have Jesus Christ abiding in the soul temple because He cannot abide there without being revealed and shown forth in fruits and good works. God wants every one of you to be His helping hand, and if you yield yourself to Him, He will teach and work through you that you may be able to impart to others. Then you will be able to say, O oh God, thy gentleness hath made me great. Manuscript 91, 1901 Thursday, April 6 Every seed produce a harvest. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes. Those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tireless on ministries of love, spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns. Those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe. And all that he endured, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face, speaks to each child of humanity declaring, It is for thee that the Son of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise. He who stilled the angry waves and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee, who opened blind eyes and called forth the dead to life, offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice, and this from love to thee. He, the sin-bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice, and for thy sake becomes sin itself. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith, he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission he committed himself to God, the sense of the loss of his Father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. The Desire of Ages, pages 755 and 756. The harvest is a reproduction of the seed sown. Every seed yields fruit after its kind. So it is with the traits of character we cherish. Selfishness, self-love, self-esteem, self-indulgence reproduce themselves, and the end is wretchedness and ruin. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit 
shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. Love, sympathy, and kindness yield fruitage of blessing, a harvest that is imperishable. In the harvest, the seed is multiplied. A single grain of wheat, increased by repeated sowings, would cover a whole land with golden sheaves. So widespread may be the influence of a single life, of even a single act. Education, page 109. The truths as presented in Revelation 14 in connection with the everlasting gospel will distinguish the Church of Christ at the time of His appearing. For as the result of the threefold message, it is announced, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this message is the last to be given before the coming of the Lord. Immediately following its proclamation, the Son of Man is seen by the prophet coming in glory to reap the harvest of the earth. The Great Controversy, page 453. For further reading, Reflecting Christ, The Transforming Power of the Holy Spirit, page 217, and Selected Messages, A Heaven to Win, Book 1, pages 97 and 98.